All right. <clears throat> now, life is like the weather. You know, when you look at the weather, you know that life is unpredictable. The weather is unpredictable. All of a sudden, you can have thunderstorm. And in this country, maybe it's not that bad, but if you had an opportunity to go to city of Melbourne, you know, in one day, you can have four seasons. And so there are sunny days, and uh, there will be windy days, stormy days, and rainy days. Jesus teaches us the challenges in life are a reality. We don't like it, you know, we don't like problems, we don't like challenges, but it is inevitable. There is no other way to live in this world. And Jesus says that in this world, you will have. You will have means there is a certainty, is a guarantee that you will have tribulation. You have a challenges, you know. The best thing is in our life is when we were young, all right? We don't seem to have any problem. We were very young, obviously. But when you go to college age and you start to go to secondary, you begin to start learning to experience some challenges. You see, no one can escape challenges unless you are insane, as I shared with you before, or unless you have dementia. People who have dementia will not have problem. The important thing is how we respond to the challenges in life will determine the destiny of our lives. Jesus teaches us the principles to change our destiny. In Mark 11, verse 22 to 24, he gave us four principles. And you need to remember these four principles if you want to change the destiny of your life. We have read in Mark 11, 22 to 24, he says, have faith in God. But that's not the Greek translation. It is not a correct translation. The correct translation is, have faith. God's faith. If you have your faith and your faith in God, it will not work. God gave us his faith in Romans chapter 12, verse 3. When you become a believer, he gave us the measure of faith. The faith that we have is God's faith. God's faith is dependable. Our faith is not dependable. So he says, have faith in God. And then he says this, whatsoever you desire. Before you can experience a change in your destiny, you must have a desire. As I mentioned last night, you must have a goal. A desire is like a goal. And you know, a lot of people living their life without desire, without goal. And I know I wouldn't say without desire. A lot of people have a desire and the desire is to be rich. Everybody have a desire to be rich. That's not a bad desire. But having a desire does not make you rich. The desire is only a dream. And the next thing he says, whatsoever you, you desire, when you pray. That's the second principle. If you want to experience a change in your destiny. When you talk about prayer, a lot of Christians are cringing because they don't pray. I won't say they don't pray. Maybe I make a correction. They don't pray when they are in cloud nine, when everything is well. But somehow... They see the need to pray when they're down in the valley, when they're facing trouble. And by that time, maybe too late. I said, why don't you pray so that you don't have trouble? Why do you want to wait for trouble? Then you pray. But unfortunately, that's what most Christians respond. I pastor for 25 years, I know. And sometimes I pray to God for trouble for my people. Because they're so complacent, it's too dangerous for them. They're too complacent, something you feel that you find that it may be very wicked or, or, or very unkind for a pastor to pray for trouble for the people. Sometimes you need to do that. Because they are so comfortable, they may slip away into the sunset. First, you must have desire. But that desire is not something that what you want, you know, a lot of people preach on this passage and they say that whatever you desire, anything you desire, you pray, you believe, you receive. No, that's not what the Bible teach. The Bible teach whatsoever you desire according to the will of God. People mistranslate it. 
Because the word whatsoever gives you uh, 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 an indication that there is no boundary and there's no limit if you look at the English word. Whatsoever desire. But we don't study scripture just based on the English. We study scripture based on the Greek and the context. The context is the Bible context, not a verse context. So first is whatsoever you desire, number one, you must have a desire. Number two, you must do something. We, having a desire, doing nothing, is you are the dreamer. Second, you pray. And what's the third thing you say? Whatsoever you desire, you pray, you believe. You believe. You must have faith. And it started with faith. Have God's faith. So you have it. But many of us don't apply the faith. All right? Believe. Have faith. And then you must have expectation. You say, whatsoever you desire, when you pray, you receive. When you pray, you believe, you receive. That means expectation. You expect what you desire. And when you pray and you believe, you receive. What's the point of praying? Don't believe that you receive. That's why a lot of people don't pray. Because many people, when they pray, they don't believe. They go through the motion of prayer. God promised to you, ask and you shall receive. But don't forget, the word ask also must be in accordance to the will of God. A lot of people quote this without understanding that it must be according to the will of God. You can keep asking till the cow come home. If it's not according to the will of God, you will not receive. That's why scripture cannot be taken out of its context. And so we can examine this four principles and these four keys in the like of Matthew 11, 22 to 24. Now what is the context of this passage? You know, today I'm giving you two passages. So I'm going to take a little bit longer if you can bear with me because I want to finish up and make it clear. I don't like 30 minutes of preaching. There is nothing. How many of you go to a hotel, eat buffet and you finish 20 minutes, you go off? You don't, right? You sit there long because there's so many food you can eat. Now, what is the context? The context, if you read it, preceding context, talks about Jesus cursed the fig tree and the fig tree withered. And the disciples were surprised. They say, Lord, how come it happens? And then Jesus, you can do the same thing if you have God's faith. Desire is the key component to experience change to your destiny. What are the synonyms of desires? What are the other meanings of desire? Number one, desire can mean a craving. A craving, a passion. You know, people with no passion when they preach, they preach like the dead people. I've come across preachers who preach with no passion. You know, when Jesus says, whatsoever you, whatsoever you desire, you pray, there's no passion, it's dead. You must have passion. Passion, project, confidence and belief the people who hears you have the confidence that you believe what you are preaching you have lust lust is a negative word but in the bible lust can be a good word lusting for the things of god that's a good word lust when you use in terms of the things of god is positive lust in terms of the world is negative so you must have a craving, you must have a passion. You must, and these are very strong emotions. When you lose interest in your wife, you've got to stir up that passion. That's very important. The passion or the fire for your wife, to love your wife must always be burning. If not, you are entering into dangerous territory. Many people live their lives without desire, as I said yesterday. Many people live their life without goals. You know, they follow the weather. When it's windy, they will be blown by the wind, you know. And these people live their life to fate, F-A-T-E, and not faith, F-A-I-T-H. Faith means que sera, sera, whatever will be, will be. You know, I sometimes marvel some Christian living by faith, F-A-T-E, Right, they believe that God provides everything. God promised to provide all my needs. All I need to do is sit there and God is going to rain the gold and the silver into my house. That is sheer foolishness. 
God provides all my need. God provides even the birds of the air. But the birds of the air did not perch on the tree, open its beak, and God dropped the seed into its mouth. The provision is in the ground. They're going to fly there. That's why they always say it's the early morning, what? Early morning catch the birds, are, something like that. I have some people who sleep until late, you know. And the Bible talks about them. You know, when the Bible talks about people who sleep very late, the Bible talks that they are like the door leaf, turning here and turning there and never get up. Very few people are successful. Very few successful people. And you find those who are successful are not like the door leaf turning every day. They rise up early in the morning. They find the seat first. So we don't live by faith. Faith. We live by faith. I want to give you some quotes, some desire quotes of great men who are successful men. Desire is the starting point of all achievements. If you have no desire, you achieve nothing. If you have no goals, you have achieved nothing. Desire is not a hope. Desire is not a wish, but a keen, pulsating desire which transcends everything. When you say transcends everything, means that when you have a desire, no obstacle in front of you can stop you, nor can hinder you. That's what I mean. It transcends. It breaks through. The other one is Marcia Wider. He says, desire is a powerful force that can be used to make things happen. <clears throat> so Jesus emphasized Desire comes before prayer. Don't pray without when you do not have a desire because you don't know why you'll be praying. Jesus says desire comes before prayer, before faith, and before expectation. If you have no desire, Jesus is telling us, don't pray. Wasting your time. Wasting your time. You got no desire what to pray. What do you tell God to do? And God says, what do you want? Don't know. I just pray only. No. Do you know why a lot of people don't pray? Because they don't have desire. If you have desire, you will pray. Don't waste your time. Don't waste God's time. If you have no desire, don't pray. Don't waste your time. Don't waste God's time. What is desire? The word desire comes from a Latin word means to give birth to. To give birth to. If you talk about human uh, destiny, all right? If you desire a child, the child has, you have to give birth to the child. But before the child can be born, there are things that you have to do. Many things that you do, if you want to have a healthy child, a brilliant child, a lot of things you need to do, you need to know. So when a person desires something in his life and he wants to give birth to that something for it to become a reality, that is expectation. When you want a child, you expect the birth of a child. So when you desire something, you must expect it to happen. A lot of people pray the K Sarah Sarah prayer. Oh, no, I want, you know, I, I need this, you know. But if you want to give to me, give to me. If not, never mind. I know, you know, I leave it to you. you know. No. You need to be certain because God needs to know what you want. Not freaking minded. A lot of people are freaking minded. When you are freaking minded, God don't know how to answer your prayer. But there are a lot of people who are freaking minded. I want to do this, I want to do that. And some people are not only freaking minded. Some people are confused themselves because there are so many things they want to do and they do not know what they want to do. You must remain focused. It must be clear. So I'm going to give you a biblical example. Have I just pressed something? Let me go back. All right. You can desire everything you want but until you are able to see yourself on the screen of your mind and proceed to act on it, you will never experience the desire. 
how many expect what you desire to happen. Never desire something you don't expect and never expect something you don't desire. That's a quote from Raymond Holloway. And so I'm going to give you a biblical example. I'm not talking about uh, something that people do not experience. I can share with you my experience, but I think it's more powerful to use a biblical example. A biblical example of a woman who were hopeless, who were husband who caused tremendous death, a son's going to be sold as slave in desperation. How she changed her destiny is from the scripture. Then we meet to 2 Kings 4, as we have read that, 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 1 to 7. So that what I'm sharing with you is something that is experience a reality in people's life. All right, can I have the PowerPoint? I think I, I need a PowerPoint. I didn't print out my notes. <coughs> ah. ah. So next time I need to print out my own pictures in case then we don't have to uh, stop a bit. Okay, so we have read that. It's talking about a woman and who came to Elijah. Uh, who came to Elisha, sorry. Who came to Elisha. Who was Elisha? Elisha was the successor of Elijah. All right? And uh, <clears throat> Second Kings chapter 4, Elisha was the one who succeeded Elijah. And the name Elisha means God of supplication. He lived up to his name. People who came to Elijah, Elisha for prayer, and Elisha was able to pray for them, and they always experienced and received what they prayed. So he was the God, and his name was the God of supplication. Now, Elisha mentored a group of prophets, and one of the prophets died. The Bible tells us in verse 1 that the prophet was a godly man. He feared God. Unfortunately, he was foolish. There's a difference between fearing God and wisdom. He feared God. Unfortunately, he was foolish. And so his wife came to Elisha after his death. His wife came to Elisha. And I want to look at her predicament. What was her situation? What was her circumstances that she was confronted with? Do you know her predicament were unbearable? Because in verse 1, the Bible says that the woman came and cried to Elijah. Uh, Elisha, he cried to Elisha. So the word cried in the Hebrew means... He, she was in great distress. You see, the English word alone doesn't give you the emotion. Doesn't give you the full turmoil that she's experiencing. But in the Hebrew, it means she was in great distress. You know, a person can cry over minor things. But when you understand the word great distress, that means the problem that she was facing was not a small thing. So she was in great distress. And I want you to know, when you have trouble, unfortunately, troubles do not come alone. Troubles came to come one after another. So what was her trouble? Number one, she lost her husband. Now in the Old Testament, when you lose your husband, it was like a death sentence for the widow. Number two, amidst the grieving for her husband, she was left with unpaid debts. So her husband was a godly man, but was foolish. He left her wife with a lot of debts. And we don't have biblical record why he left the wives with a lot of debts. But in the Hebrew stories that you read through, is that Elijah, the, the husband was a very generous and kind man. Her husband was always helping others. 
to the point that he borrowed money to help others and that's the most foolish thing to do. You don't get yourself into trouble by borrowing money to help others. All right? You need to help others, but when you don't have, don't borrow to help others, okay? And so that's what happened. She died and she left the wife with a great amount of death. The third problem she was confronted with because of the debt and she was unable to pay, the creditor came to take his two sons to be slaves. That was the third problem. All right? Computer is there. You will take out my computer. Yeah, at the side there. Give me a minute. Okay, I will do multitasking. All right, so. The creditors were demanding to take her two sons as slave, adding to her sorrows because the two sons were her future. Her future was bleak. She had no capacity to repay the debt as she has no skills, no trades, and no money. Now, it was not known if she had any family and whether she can turn to her family for help. So what was the situation? Number one, she was helpless. Number two, she was desperate. Number three, she was utterly heartbroken and uh, she was at the end of her robes. Alright, so now let's look at her desire. Now she was in a hopeless situation. She was end of her robe. That was the situation. I need to paint that situation to you. So she was in a desperate situation and she wanted to change her situation. Now before she can change the situation, the Bible teaches number one, she must have a desire. What's the desire? Her desire was to experience a new destiny. Let's look at what was her situation? What was her desire? Okay? Now, her desire, number one, she could have easily gone into depression. People under such circumstances, let's be honest, they can go into depression. Number two, she could have even committed suicide because... She was in debt and because her, she's going to lose her children, going to lose her children. Number three, she could complain and murmur against God, isn't it? There are some people who do that, complain, complain and murmur against God. Number four, or she could have cursed God like Job's wife. He, Job told his wife, you know, uh, uh, his wife told Job, he said, curse God and die. She could have done that too, but she didn't. What did she do? She had a desire to see, number one, what was her desire? A desire to see her husband's debt paid. That's what she desired. 
Number two, she had a desire to see her two sons not to be sold as slaves. That was her desire. Now the next thing is, what did she do? What was her action? So she had a desire, but you need to do something. So what was her action? So the first thing she did was, she went to the man of God, prophet Elisha. So she went to prophet Elisha. And in the Old Testament, in the Old Testament, when one desired God's intervention in his life or her life, he goes or he, she goes to see the prophet of God or the priest. Because that's how in the Old Testament, the, the prophet or the priest were the leaders who lead the people. Today, obviously, we don't have to do that. For example, David went to the prophet to seek God's will before he goes into battle. Whatever he did, he seek the will of God. He either went to the prophet or he went to the priest. The prophet or the priest, it was the intermediary at a time. And today we don't do that, right? In the New Testament, every believer can go to God directly because Jesus is the mediator. We don't have to go through a third party. But I know many people go through the pastors. Whenever they have a problem, they ask the pastor to pray. And I always tell, tell people, and one day there was somebody who came to, uh, during the ministry time. Uh, somebody came and... Uh, and uh, uh, for prayer. <clears throat> and she says, you know, Pastor, now can you pray for me? And I spoke to her. I said, no. And she stared at me. Pastor, can you pray for me? I said, no. She stared at me. I said, why don't you learn to pray for yourself? I'm not here all the time. Your pastor is not here all the time. Your pastor has to go and rest and have holiday also. Then what happened? You wait for your pastor to come back. And so I told her, I'm not going to pray for you, but I'm going to pray with you. You pray, you pray. If you don't know how to pray, follow me. But you pray. Most of the time, you always ask pastor pray, pastor pray, as though pastor is God. No, we are not God. You must learn to pray yourself. Don't depend on pastor. Especially when you are older Christian, I'm not talking about a young baby. Young baby cannot talk, we understand. By three years old, they will learn how to talk. That means by the time you are three years Christian, you must learn how to pray a little already. So what did, <coughs> what did, all right, Jesus mediator. So what did uh, Elisha tell him? Uh, hey, how come I suddenly skipped here? Wait, 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 I think there's some problem here. All right. So Elisha asked him, he went to Elisha and Elisha asked him, what do you want me to do? All right. And then he told, uh, uh, she told Elisha, I have dead. My two sons are going to be taken as slave. And so Elisha asked her, what do you have in your house? In verse 2, what do you have in your house? And then she responded, she says that, I only have a little oil. And you know, God can use a little that you have and multiply it. You understand? God can use a little that you have and multiply it. Remember, when trouble comes, what do you do? First, go to God. Most people, when the trouble comes, who did they go to? They look for a pastor. No, go to God first. I'm not saying you cannot look for a pastor. You must learn to go to God first. Not go to the pastor first. But in the Old Testament, it's different. In the Old Testament, the, the prophet and the priest were God's representative. It's different. So she went straight to Elisha and Elisha asked her what she wants. Remember Jesus says what? Ask and you shall receive. That's why Elisha asked her, what do you want? Elisha said to her, what do you have in your house? And she said, uh, she had nothing, only a pot of oil. And as mentioned to you, God can use a little and multiply it. So God used a small boy's lunch of five loaves and two fishes to multiply to feed 5,000. Number three, her faith. Remember, first her desire, second, prayer, because she went to the prophet. That's prayer. 
All right? Number three, her faith. The third principle is there, her faith. So what did she do? She then acted on her faith. Do you know, when Elijah spoke to her, what do you want? And you have a little, and then he began to give, him instruct, give her instruction what to do, right? And say, go and borrow uh, empty vessels. She has to act on it. Many times we pray and God gives us instruction, we don't act on it and we expect a result. You never have that. You must act on your faith. So she had faith and she acted on it. Faith is demonstrated by her action. You know, faith is action. How do I know you have faith? Because faith is seen in your action. How do you know? If you tell me that you believe this chair can support your weight, if you really believe, you should sit down and demonstrate to me. By just talking, I believe, I believe, is useless. Many Christians say, I believe, I believe, I believe. But they never act on it. Because if you never act on it, you can never see the reality of your faith. So faith is a demonstration or demonstrated by your action. And she went, the instruction was go and borrow empty vessels. How do I know she had faith? She went. She acted on the instruction. She went to borrow vessels, not a few. She did not doubt what Elisha said. She could have, you know. She would have questioned Elisha before even going. You asked me to go and borrow empty vessels from my neighbors. You know, I don't know whether they will lend it to me. Uh, these are the people with no faith. These are people whose minds are filled with excuses. She didn't say that. She didn't tell Elisha. I don't know whether my, the, my neighbors will, will, will lend me or give me their empty vessels. No. She was a very positive woman. She believed it and she's going to go and do it. Not finding excuses not to do it. But there are many Christians finding excuses not to do it. When they fail, what do they do? They blame their mother, they blame their father, they blame everybody. How can you change your destiny if you don't take personal responsibility for your life? Because I've counseled people, you know, when they are in trouble, they, why are they like this? They will say, because my mother, la, because my father, la, because my circumstances, la, because all kind of grandfather story, how are you going to change your life when you keep giving excuses? Take personal responsibility. This is the first one. If not, you can never change your destiny. Whatever you are, whatever city you are. So she believed Elisha and she went to borrow empty vessels from her neighbor. And I want you to know, how come she was a woman of faith? Because there was an example of faith in the house. Her husband must have been a person of great faith, a great model in the home. Having great faith doesn't mean you're wise. Huh? As I mentioned, the husband was godly, had great faith, but yet she, he was foolish. Why? Because she acted on his emotion. When people are in need, full of compassion, you go and borrow money to help people. No, you don't do that. The Bible, Paul never says, go and borrow money and give to God. Paul says, you have your money and you give, not borrow money. Uh, in our church, I don't know whether you practice say in our church, we don't practice, uh, what, do you, what do we call that? Pledges. We don't practice pledges. Give what you have. Paul says, set aside, give. What you don't have, don't give. Because when you give, I know there are some Christians, what they do, they practice pledges and then they cannot pay. What the Bible says, when you make a vow to God, God expects you to keep it. If not, it's a curse on you. We don't practice pledges. Give what you have. All right? Uh, so what happened is her husband was a, a model of faith. All right? So we, we saw first, what did we see? First we say she had a desire and then what happened? The next thing is she, she prayed. And then the third thing is she believed. She believed. And the fourth one is expectation. See the principle of Mark 11, 22 and 24. That is an example, a biblical example. All right, expectation. And you read that in verse 3 to verse 6. So she went, she borrowed many vessels from her neighbor. She closed the door because Elisha said, close the door. Now what happens if she doesn't close the door? You will no miracles. Because if you want to see miracle, you must follow God's instruction. There's not time we pray for people, there's no miracle, nothing happened because we didn't follow instruction. When Peter went into the temple to pray in Acts chapter 3, 
when he healed a lame man, God gave him instruction for the miracle to happen. He says, take hold of the beggar's hand and lift him up. What happened? He didn't. Eh? Stand up and walk. There will be no miracle. See, you have to understand. You must follow exactly the instruction of God. That's the same. You must follow exactly what the Bible teaches us. If you don't follow, don't expect result. All right, so she shut the door as instructed by Elisha. And again, faith not, is not only demonstrated in action, but actually is demonstrated by obedience. You obey, that's why you do it. Not just action. Do it by obedience. So she poured out whatever vessel oil she had into the empty vessel. And the Bible tells us, verse 3 to 6, oil kept pouring into the empty vessels until there was no more empty vessels. She poured, she poured oil into the ve empty vessels. When all the vessels were filled, the oil stayed. Obviously, the oil stayed. God does not waste things. If there's no more empty vessel, the oil will stop. God doesn't waste anything. In fact, we are not supposed to waste. She got, remember, she got only as much oil as the vessels she had borrowed. And so if she's, la if she's lazy, borrow a few, then she will only have a few. If she's diligent, she will borrow more. Okay? So when there's no more vessels, God work no more miracles. When faith asks no more, God gave no more. So as a result, as I mentioned, the principles of changing your destiny. As a result, her destiny changed. Verse 7. But first of all, what? Desire. Second what? Pray. Third, faith. Fourth, expectation. She expects. And then she see her destiny change in verse 7. She had all the oil. I think most of us probably in a situation would have regretted. Right? Because most of us have greed, right? I, uh, we should have borrowed more empty vessels, isn't it? Correct or not? Because we are always human beings of greed, you know. Now let's look at her destiny change. So what happened? She sold her, the oil and with the money, she paid her debts. With the money, she had her sons back because she was able to pay her debts. And the Bible tells us very clearly in the verse, and I want you to read verse uh, seven. Then she came and told the man of God, and the man of God said, "Go sell the oil and pay thy death, and live thou and thy children of the rest." So what God has provided is God has provided enough for them to live their life. God never provide half half full. God will provide. All that you need throughout your life. That's what the Bible says here, right? So what happens? Her, her destiny was changed, isn't it? Because she was hopeless in the beginning, but now she, is, she was no longer ho hopeless. She was helpless in the beginning. Now she was no longer helpless. She was desperate in the beginning. She was no longer desperate. Her life was never the same. Let me conclude. You see, what I have shared yesterday and what I have shared today are something that is real, that you can experience. It's a reality. I experienced that myself. My life destiny changed. Nobody gave me a chance in my village. When I grow up in my village, in poverty, very poor village, nobody gave me a chance. But I have to make the decision. Because I made a decision at the age of six. I had a desire at the age of six. That desire changed my destiny. Let me conclude. If you feel trapped and felt like you are at the end of your rope. And sometimes there are people actually at the end of their rope. When you're at, a, at the end of your rope, it's very dangerous. You know? You've got no more rope for you. You're going to fall. And people at this, this kind of situation, if they don't have a strong will, 
may end up committing suicide. When the waves of hopelessness crash on you relentlessly, all right, one wave hit you, you can tahan, you can stand, another you may be able to stand, but if the wave come crashing at you relentlessly, you may not be able to stand. When you feel abandoned, and there are situations where sometimes we feel abandoned by people whom we trust and that the burden is too overwhelming. What do you do? Don't permit the troubles of your life to determine your destiny. When you believe in God, troubles, circumstances do not determine your destiny. But you must make necessary action. You cannot just sit there and expect God to work. We have seen in the passage that she has to play her own role to see her destiny change. Do not allow, and I've seen people allowing troubles to determine the destiny of their life. So like this widow, which is a biblical example, it's a real life example, it's not a narrative, it is not a story, it's a real life example. Like this widow, you can change your destiny by applying the principles in Mark 11, 22 to 24. Ask yourself, what is your desire? What is your desire? You can't even pray without you knowing what is your desire. What is your desire? And when you know what your desire is, then the next thing you need to do is to pray and to seek God's intervention. Number three, you must have faith to trust God to deliver and to provide. Number four, expectation reflects true faith. When you have faith, it means you expect the thing to happen. So expectation reflects true faith. Today, as we begin the year 2023, we are on the eighth day, I think it's the eighth day of 2023. I guarantee you, I guarantee you, for the year 2023, there will not be smooth sailing. I guarantee you that. You will experience storms. You will experience trouble. It may be small, it may be big, nobody knows. Jesus says, you will experience tribulation. So I hope this message brightly in your heart because you will need it in 2023. You will need it in 2024. You will need it in 2025. You will need this for the rest of your life. I'm sharing with you a principle that will help you for the rest of your life. Regardless of the storm or the trouble or the adversities, remember these do not determine the destiny of your life. It is how you respond to them which determine your destiny. So I pray that you will have something in your hand today that will help you, not for 2023 alone, but that will help you for the rest of your life. Now, if you are parents and you are young people, I've always made this very important. If your destiny don't change, even if you are young people, if your destiny don't change, your future generation will not change. If you as a parent don't change your destiny, your children will not change their destiny. It's a very important message for us to remember. Shall we stand and shall we pray? Father, we want to thank you and praise you for your word says, heaven and earth shall pass away. Your word will never pass away. Every dot, every tittle of your word, you watch over to perform it. We thank you, Lord that you are not only concerned for our spiritual life, but you, Lord, love us so much that you have 
plan for us for every area and every dimension of our life. And you know, Lord, that because we are fallen, we will encounter challenges and troubles and storms of life. But you did not leave us to deal with it alone. You have made provision for us, giving us the principles in your word. That when we act upon those principles, we will be able to see the reality of the change in our destiny. In fact, the very beginning when we receive you as the Lord and Savior, you promise us that we will be new creation. That is a new destiny. Not only for us, but that new destiny, that new creation will influence and impact our generations to come. So I pray, Lord, that you write this principle in our heart, that the Holy Spirit will bring it to remembrance. And that's the work of the Holy Spirit. In John chapter 14, the work of the Spirit is bring us to remembrance everything that you say in your word, so that we will be like the widow, that we will not be in a helpless and hopeless situation when we turn to you. We want to thank you and praise you. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. All right, if you want prayer, I can pray for you. As I mentioned, I want you to pray yourself, but today I'm going to do something different. All right, to encourage you, I pray with you. Maybe I won't pray for you, I pray with you. And uh, so that you can learn how to pray.